I wanted to do a quick little video on a new piece of equipment or a new old piece of equipment that I've just come by. And uh, this is from an online auction site and it's always uh, a bit dodgy purchasing old equipment or any equipment for that matter from such a site because you can't really test it, touch it, kick the tires as it were before purchasing. But I took a chance on this. It looked like it was in good condition and I wanted to do a preliminary video uh, opening it up and looking at it. So this is an Ico model 667 so-called dynamic conductance tube tester. You can see that it's very shiny, very clean. I was very happy to get this and see that it was in this condition. All the knobs are present. Uh, I think this chicken head knob is a replacement from an original uh, because you can see that the uh, silk screening is a little bit larger than the knob itself. All right, but the other knobs and buttons and uh, handles on the levers, they all look pristine and clean. Maybe one little chip on this one, but otherwise in good shape. All of the, zoom back out here, all of the, what, 14 screws are present. Always a good sign. If the screws aren't present, then probably not only has someone been in it, but they decided that it was enough of a basket case that it wasn't worth putting the screws back in. So that's good. Uh, and there's very little signs of rust on it. Uh, if you look at the uh, metal here. This is, this is oxidized. But on the inside, there's not a lot of sign of rust. So I think this has been in a moist environment at one point, maybe for an extended period of time. But it hasn't uh, affected the, the face of it. The meter is in very good shape. There are no scratches or chips out of it. The, uh, the plate cap attachment is there. And what moved me to get this Ico is in the picture in the online auction was this tag. And you see the tag is a factory quality control tag. We have not only the model number but the job number and the initials of the final inspector and the person who tested it. So this is a very good sign and it suggests that this was a factory assembled item and not something that was built in a home workshop. <clears throat> the reason that's important is that oftentimes when you buy old equipment that was sold in kit form, it uh, was assembled by someone who may or may not know, uh, have known what they were doing, may or may not have had good soldering uh, technique, uh, and may or may not have assembled it correctly. So if you're troubleshooting, it's nice if you start with a fairly high confidence that it worked at one point and was assembled as, as uh, it was intended. Uh, I'm going to pull this off here in just a moment. It, came with a manual. This is the uh, version of the 667 that does not have an internal roll chart. The data for the different tubes is available in uh, book booklet format. And this one is dated uh, 1973, probably January 5th, 1973, uh, meaning that this instrument is probably 
1973-1974 vintage. The ICO 666, which was the predecessor to the 667, as well as the 667 model, are notorious for having errors in the tube charts. Uh, so this is um, this is good that it comes with the uh, Coltronics manual for the tube settings. Okay, see Coltronic Services who took over uh, stewardship and possibly even testing of the settings for the ICO 666 and 667 tube testers, uh, probably in the late 60s or early 70s, as far as I can tell. The owner's manual uh, came with a copy of the warranty, uh, and it's copyrighted 1973 as well. So as tube testers go, this is a fairly um, a fairly recent addition to the tube testing family. It was almost certainly the last tube tester that ICO produced. For that matter, it's probably one of the last pieces of test equipment that ICO produced before they got out of the business. Uh, just a couple other things before start to dig into this and in this video we're not going to turn it on uh, because I need to go through and check things, check resistors. The schematic suggests there are all of two electrolytic capacitors in there so probably just replace those but you know, we'll certainly at least test them. Uh, there's no selenium in this model. They had transitioned to silicon diodes by this point. That's good. Uh, but we'll we'll verify that in in just a minute when we take the case off. Uh, but I did a couple other I did want to talk about a couple other things that caught my eye. There is rust present on the inside of this cabinet, um, and it's not clear to me that that rust pattern was suffered when the cabinet had been closed. I suspect that what happened is somebody set this on their bench with the case open and you know maybe on a shelf next to the bench or under the bench sat equipment on top of the top case and you know this is I'm probably really using my imagination here but my goodness that looks like a, a footprint of a soldering pencil holder it could have been many things but I just wonder if someone had set that down at one point uh, and it had been moist and then left it for for some time. All right, why don't we grab a screwdriver and just do a couple of things here. Uh, let's take the cord off. The, the, the cord is not cracking. There's no rubber rod. It's very supple. Again, it's, a, it's an unpolarized two-prong cord, standard for this class of equipment in that day. First thing I want to do is look at the fuse holder, which is very nicely mounted on the top of the chassis, and look at the fuse. As I look at this, it does not appear blown. It's a good thing and um, see if we can get this to focus. Uh, I won't even try. I'll just look at this and determine that it's a one amp fuse. All right. Let's put that back uh, and look quickly at the schematic and see what value the fuse should be. That's often a good way to understand if this has suffered abuse in its most recent lifetime. And uh, so we see right here is the power line. And we see right there, fuse F1 is listed as one amp. So that's good. No one has stuffed a, an oversized fuse in there 
keep it from blowing. Outstanding. Uh, all right. I, there's no reason uh, to watch me take the screws out on this. So let's uh, pause this. I'll take the screws out and we'll look under the, uh, under the face plate of this and see what we've got. Just one observation that, uh, that I'll make here. I've taken two screws off and let me see if I can get this zoomed and focused in such a way that we can see there. If you look closely, you can just see little whiskers growing out of the tip of that screw. And that is common, that is true of the first two screws that I've taken out. They're standing off of the body of the screw in a way that looks like the screws become magnetized. And these are metal shavings. Uh, they're not huge metal shavings, but they're enough that you can see them, and they're definitely magnetized. Um, I don't know if you can kind of make that out, but it's a little disturbing. But we will see when we open this up if there are metal shavings anywhere else in the cabinet. If there aren't, then we can just uh, maybe blow it out and then take a uh, light vacuum and go over it just to make sure that we don't have metal shavings uh, floating around internal to the cabinet. <clears throat> so I know I said that there was no reason to watch me take these screws out, and there isn't, of course, uh, but I've just about got them all out now, and I wanted to show the shavings uh, because metal shavings and electronic circuitry are not ever good bedfellows. Okay, and here comes screw number 14 here. I'm going to take the back off just so we have a little bit more room. Okay, and uh, set the schematic aside. And uh, this lifts off very nicely. And you always need to be careful doing this because oftentimes the sides of these underneath have very sharp edges. And uh, you know, you don't want to cut yourself. And you especially don't want to cut yourself with something that is uh, rusty and has been in an uncertain environment for a number of years. All right, let's go mobile, as it were, and pick this up. I've had a fair amount of coffee today, so hopefully I won't make anyone seasick with the shakes. So the first thing that we see here, zoom in just a bit, are a set of precision resistors. These are listed as 1% resistors. Um, if we look here at the solder joints, these are clearly professionally done. Someone who knew how to solder did this soldering. This is not amateur soldering. So that all but cements it that this is uh, a factory unit. We have a sticker here. It says model 667 and then some other codes that I don't understand what they are. And look at this. There is a stamp that says tested May 23rd. 1973 or 4. I think that's a 4. <clears throat> Tested May 23rd, 
1974. It's a bit smeared. And then it says Ico Electronics. Yep. <clears throat> so there we go. It's definitely a factory unit. Here is a uh, 200 ohm third of an amp rheostat or wire wound potentiometer. We have carbon composition resistors in here along with wire wound. Uh, here is one of two electrolytic capacitors. That one there. And there's one down here. Uh, I'm not seeing any obvious signs of anything hokey or obviously replaced in this unit. Uh, lots of different taps on the uh, transformer here for different filament voltages, no doubt. The uh, cables are wrapped nicely with table uh, cable ties. And even the tube sockets themselves, it's kind of hard to see. Um, don't really have a a light that's going to shine down in there, but if you look down into the holes of the tubes, there's not a lot of dust. Uh, this this was well taken care of and apparently stored in a worthy uh, environment. All right, uh, just look a little bit more closely at the switches here on the lever assembly. Nothing looks awry or out of line there. No obvious issues. So there we are. Let's put this uh, back and just conclude with a, a few final thoughts. Okay, I've got the uh, plate back on this ICO 667 tube tester. When I looked inside, there were no metallic filings that I could see in the bottom of the case. So we'll just clean those up and we'll blow out the circuitry uh, with compressed air just to make sure. Uh, one other thing uh, just w is noteworthy is the meter appears to be fine. You see when I rock it back and forth, the needle uh, gently moves. So we, there's no reason to think that the, uh, the meter is damaged, although we will, of course, uh, do all the appropriate tests when I've looked at the capacitors and determined that it's safe to plug this in and, and turn it on, which we will do in a future video. All right, quick one, ICO 667 Dynamic Conductance Tube Tester. The dynamic conductance tube tester was a type of emissions tester, uh, but it was an emissions tester with a twist, and we'll talk about that a bit in the next video. If you want to skip ahead and you have a copy of Alan Douglas's book on antique tu tube testers, he treats the uh, topic in depth in there and talks a bit about this particular tester as well. So I encourage you to go look at that in the meantime. I hope you found this interesting. If so, please give a big thumbs up below. As always, thanks for watching.